Well, grace to you all and peace from God, our Creator, and from Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, today's passage from Matthew, one of of my favorite authors, kind of who I follow, a rabbi, a guy named Ed Friedman, he said something, I think, very telling about this passage, well, just in Jesus' words in general, but I think it's very true about this passage. And he said about Jesus, he said, people seem to forget that Jesus said far more challenging words than comforting ones. Jesus' challenging statements far outnumber his comforting ones. The things he said challenged much more than they were um, receiving verbal hugs. You know, in, in, in our image of how we imagine Jesus um, to have been, we imagine Jesus as the super kind, loving Son of God, um, willing to hug us all the time and being nice and saying nice things. And that's true. But he was far more challenging, I think, um, than just nice. And this is one of those passages. There's a lot of stuff in there that's tough. I haven't come to bring peace to the world. I've come to bring a sword. Um, Those who follow me, you know what? Well, uh, those who follow me who take up the cross are worthy of me. If you take up a cross, what's it mean? You're going to get crucified. We all know how that story ends. But think of that. Dragging the cross through the streets of Jerusalem. It's normally not on our list of things to do. And then what else did Jesus come to do? Um, Yep. You're going to have enemies in your own household. Um, father and son are going to turn against each other. Mother and daughter are going to turn against each other. Mother-in-law and daughter-in-law are going to be set against one another. I think of those, that last one, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law are going to be set against each other. Not that surprising. It already happens lots all over the place. But the first two, children set against their parents, that's tough stuff. So we got all this challenge there. And we don't like it. We don't. We're not a people who really likes it. We like hugs. We like the good stuff, the nice stuff, the kind stuff. That's what we like. We like that peace. What do we pray for every week in the prayers of the people? And usually I just go off the top of my head, um, but the ones that are put out by various church resources, whether it be the ELCA or Augsburg Fortress, or, you know, there's always a prayer for peace in there. I remember one, um, I think it was New Year's Eve where it was I and Emily and we were um, in her hometown of Wishick, North Dakota. And we're all sitting around the table. Um, I think it was about 10 p.m. or so because none of us could actually stay up till midnight. And her grandfather said something. And her grandfather spent 27 years in the Marines, um, uh, was a veteran of three wars, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And I did think about, really, I want to marry this guy's granddaughter. Oh, boy. But aside from that, 27-year Marine, and we're all giving our hopes about the next year. And he says, well, I'm an old military man. And my biggest wish for the world is peace. That maybe people might not be killing each other. So we like peace. We're a people who wants it at all costs. 
And so then what's it mean when we hear Jesus say, I haven't come to bring peace, I've come to bring the sword. It's challenging stuff. It's tough stuff. I think it is. And there's other stuff in there. So we don't like the challenge, but there's other stuff in there. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. I posted on Facebook a status update. I said, um, tomorrow's sermon, the sermon title, Secrets Are Lies, Secrets Are Lies. And I think it actually increased attendance this morning by about five to seven people. It's wonderful. But it gets to something bigger. How we function in a community with each other. And thinking about that secret stuff that, that Jesus talks about. That stuff's destructive. What does he tell his disciples to do? Tell this stuff, shout it from the rooftops. Because that openness is powerful. The devil wants things underneath. And if you don't think there's secrecy, let me see, which story should I... I'll do this one. Um, here's what I want you to do. We're going to work with secrecy just a bit. I want you to um, think of a secret in your mind and put it in your head. It could be about yourself. It could be about other people. But it's something that other people don't know for the most part. And put it in your mind and think back and close your eyes. And when you nod, I'll know that you have one. Okay, some are okay. Eyes closed? Okay. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to take that secret, and um, on the count of three, you're going to blurt it out. Okay, ready? Don't laugh. You've got to blurt it out. I'll blurt out mine. Ready? Um, after three. One, two, three. I'm not wearing any underwear. Okay. I really am. But that stuff, that stuff back up in here in the mind is powerful stuff, controlling stuff. And if it gets blurted out from the rooftops, well, Lyle's state of underwear might make the coffee rounds. But if that stuff gets blurted out from the rooftops, people are afraid of one thing not being at peace with other people. Tough stuff. It is. And if, if my point hasn't been driven home, if you're not there, if you really believe that secrecy is not that powerful, I want you to think about this one. I was talking to Pastor Jenny um, from Dana Bode. Uh, well, I talked to her all the time. I think this one was two weeks ago. And um, she was at a presentation by a guardian ad litem, so somebody who's in protective social services, and she heard a statistic that just rocked her world. Um, she said of all children, um, one in four girls um, are sexually abused, one in six boys. And if that doesn't rock your world, you're not paying attention. And all that stuff, secret under the radar, not from the rooftops. Wow. So where does that leave us? Well, we've got that law stuff, that challenge stuff from Jesus. That's tough. That's where we fall short. Um, we fall short by not acting out boldly by being afraid of all that junk, whatever it might be, that secret stuff from moving forward in the world, from bringing out the kingdom of God. And we fall short in that challenge because not most of us don't go sign me up to carry that cross to get crucified. And we fall short because what do we want? We want that peace at all costs. That's what we want. 
That's how we fall short. And Jesus' message here is that that peace that we want at all, com- com- all costs, it doesn't come from the way that we think it. It doesn't come from peacekeeping. It just doesn't come from silence. It doesn't come from those things. It doesn't come from just sitting back in our pews, waiting for things to happen. We're in our families. No. It's a bit different. It comes from venturing out, voyaging out. This passage here from Matthew uh, was when Jesus was sending out the disciples, the twelve, in Matthew. And it's not right in this chunk, but he says, See, I'm sending you out like sheep amongst wolves. That's how peace comes about. That's how peace comes about. So we know we fall short. We do. So where's the gospel and all this stuff? Well, the gospel, how we, addressing how we fall short, I think all we need to do is point to the one who's sending us. And who's the one who's sending the twelve? Who's the one, and hence, sending us? Well, it's Jesus who's sending us out. Good point. Uh, to last week's reading, the Great Commission. It's another sending out text in Matthew, um, post-resurrection, and where he sends everybody out and says, "Go um, baptize all nations, teaching. Uh, go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit." And don't forget that I'm with you always until the end of the age. That's the gospel. Or in that last verse of today's passage, it's a little different. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Saying it another way, I'm sending you out to venture forward so you might actually find your life because you're losing it. How's that work? Um, should you ever have the chance um, to hang out with a group of pastors? First, uh, you know, get ten pastors in a group and just listen to them. Um, first off, I want you to give me a phone call because I'll say a quick prayer for you. But usually what you hear is actually not unlike the venting of any other occupation. When pastors get together, they bemoan the state of the church and how it's dying. When teachers get together, what do they do? They bemoan the state of the schools. When parents get together, usually they bemoan the state of all children. Um, when grandparents get together, um, they, I would say, bemoan kind of the state of everyone young. And it gets to a bigger point. It does. Things are dying all the time. Sometimes literally people dying. But also the customs, the traditions, life as we know it is constantly and consistently dying. I think in 20 years, um, the church as we know it, not just First English, will look radically different. 50 years from now, actually, Christianity in the United States will probably look much closer to um, an expression of home churches rather than anything we see here. We're constantly dying, constantly losing our lives, and that's the gospel, because we believe in a Jesus who raises us up. That no matter how much we might fail, how much we might not venture forward, in the end, the kingdom of God is going to come. Those who seek to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life will find it for my sake. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.